Yep, you're good. All right, guys, let's let's get started. So, a uh, few more lectures probably on these gas variational equations. Um, before I do so, is anyone interested in going to KSC for a day? Field trip? Each one goes by himself. That's what we done last year. Last year, one of our sponsors and NASA was actually able to meet us and gave us a special tour of the shuttle and the engines in particular because he worked on those for uh, quite some time. So. Maybe with Patrick, I'll send some kind of survey to see how many want to come. Everyone will go with his own or her own vehicle or just, you know, we'll, we'll, we can carpool. But I don't want to organize anything official. Uh, I always like to go. Last uh, Saturday, they launched, of course, they launched all the time. They launched a Delta IV, medium size, uh, geostationary, geosynchronous military satellite. So it was something going pretty high. Um, it was really nice. You could see the boosters detaching and then spinning out of control because you could see these lights going on and off. If you haven't seen a launch, you should really do it. Um, you know, this was past f Saturday, two days ago, around 8 p.m., 8 something p.m. When you're going, Casey? When I'm going again? Uh, I don't know. Sometimes I try to time it with the launch if it's at a reasonable time, like between you know 10 a.m. and 8 p.m. Because um, it's almost it's two and a half hours from here or so. So, but hey, if you guys want to go, we can uh, organize it. Um, if you haven't been there, you know some of you may move out of the state, and it's you know you should really go to KSC at least once. So okay, so these are the equations that we have started discussing last time. Uh, plus, there is the one for the same major axis that I gave you independently on the board, and we can uh, just rewrite here which is dA dt is equal to 2A squared E sine of theta over H perturbation in the radial direction plus 2A cubed 1 minus E squared over HR perturbation in the tangential direction. So uh, we said these are first order differential equations. There's a little more to say. They are obviously first order nonlinear differential equations, right? At the end of the day, each of these six equations, so this one plus those five that you see there, is looking something like this. Some derivative of a, par a particular orbital parameter you care about, some nonlinear expression that multiplies the radial part of perturbation plus another nonlinear expression, tangential plus another nonlinear expression uh, normal to the orbit, right? And these things in here are coefficients that are functions of the orbital parameters themselves, as you can see there. If I go to the EDT, I see that the radial component is multiplying times a nonlinear expression of the angular momentum and the true anomaly, and so on and so forth. Uh, the, the time derivative of the inclination vector is only affected by a perturbation normal to the orbital plane, and here there is a clear nonlinear function of the radius, angular momentum, uh, argument of perigee, and true anomaly. So they all look like that, and in most of the cases, not all three terms are present, um, and, uh, and we need to usually integrate them numerically, as we'll probably start doing at the end of this lecture. And uh, where did we leave last time? We left off uh, trying to understand how to um, model the effects of drag. For example, you have any questions on this? Yeah. Yeah, the first question on the board is different from the one you gave us in the last class. Is it? Yeah. What did you have here instead of this? That's what you have instead of this? Yeah. Okay, what is P? Yeah. Semilatus rectum, it's your position vector magnitude at uh, true anomaly 90 degrees. This is P, which is one of those million formulas you can have in your book um, where P is equivalent to A1 minus E squared. That's, that's just, yeah. Any other questions? You can prove this yourself. Just 
go back to you know astrodynamics 101 the expression of the Keplerian expression for an orbit radius function of theta no way went to sleep and um, and substitute theta equals 90 degrees okay um, well actually I'm not gonna need this for a while so let's uh, let's look at drag I don't think we need this well this one probably let's just do the case for same major axis and then I'll give you the result for the other one so I want to see what happens to the same major axis if I have a drag force which we approximate as minus 1 over 2 rho density of the atmosphere ballistic coefficient we said we just uh, compact everything in there CDA over M uh, V squared V and this is neglecting the velocity of the atmosphere. There was a question, is this a legit thing to do? Well, I'll leave it up to you to determine whether it's legit or not. What is the velocity of the rotating atmosphere? So assuming that the atmosphere is a solid piece attached to the planet at say 400 kilometers, the altitude of the ISS, where would you expect that to be maximum, first of all? If you have the atmosphere rotating with the planet, where are you gonna get the highest V at, at ATM? At the equator, right? So compute that with the angular velocity of the planet. You have code for that. I posted it. So there is a part where I do the cross product of those uh, angular velocity of the planet and uh, your position. And uh, you figure out what kind of velocity you get. Uh, keep in mind that at that altitude, you get about seven kilometers per second or a little more for the spacecraft by itself. So see if it's comparable. It's probably it's not a good idea to ignore it all the time, but uh, we need to do it just to prove some conceptual, you know, um, some formulas here, some to understand on a piece of paper what is the behavior we should expect for the same major axis. Okay, so we break these into radial and tangential. So when you start talking about gas variational equations, since they're given in this form, Every time you have a perturbation, it doesn't matter what it is, you better resolve it into LVLH. End of the story. You have to project it into LVLH. We'll see what the book does for J2, for example. We're not going to demonstrate that because that is a big uh, transformation with that matrix we showed last time. But it's, you know, the procedure is projecting into a certain basis. Okay, so what do we do with this? It's minus 1 over 2 density, ballistic coefficient, velocity squared. Uh, I'm going to break the velocity into the tangential component and the radial component, and I know there's nothing else over its norm, right? So this is my V hat, all right? Which in the end is going to give me, let's see, minus one over two, density, it's a minus here, B, let's see, V, V, S in the tangential direction, and then I have a similar term here, V, V radial in the radial direction. Agree? Does it make sense? This is the key part that allows me to just go straight to projection in the LVLH. And we have done this uh, at the very beginning at some point where we said we may want for a given orbit, we may want to look at the velocity vector and, and, um, and break it into the ra radial direction and tangential direction, remember that? Except at the time we called this UR and these, I think, U perpendicular, but it's, it's the same two directions. Okay. So what do I have to do now? This is what, uh, well, what, what do you do now to figure out specifically what happens to this equation where I have the drag? What would you substitute in here? What is your PR? This is PR. It's projected on the R direction, and this is PS. 
So you have to plug those in there. And we get something we can, we can understand. All right, let's do it. Can I get rid of this so that I don't pull up the projector? I think so, right? All right. It's just a few steps. So for drag, so now I'm specializing these for drag only. All right, so I have, uh, this is PR, so look at that PR substitute, you get minus two A squared eccentricity sine of theta over H, and I have one over two density B velocity, normal the velocity vector component in the other direction, minus, uh, what do I have here? I have two a, a cubed, one minus e squared, h r p s, which is the minus is taken care of, one over two density, ballistic coefficient, normal the velocity, radial component of the velocity. Did I make a mistake? Yeah, that was the radial. This is the tangential, sorry. Yes. Okay. So, this goes away, this goes away, this goes away, this goes away. You have minus a squared e sine of theta over h rho b v v r. I'm just rewriting it without the two. Minus a cubed. Minus v squared h r rho b v v s. I'm thinking if I want to simplify something here. I think that's good enough. <coughs> what is um, there's something that we can simplify, actually. What is H? Is it RB? That's the norm of H, right? So, uh, According to my notes, this doesn't need any modification. It's fine as it is. I like that. I'm not going to change that much. According to my notes, I don't like that one. What do you want to do? I know what the answer is. I have it here. I can do something there. That is actually the most important term. This one is, is, as you can see, other than this that you know, can change through the atmosphere, but let's assume it's constant for a while. This is a characteristic of your spacecraft. This is gonna change, but you know, you have, you have this sine of theta uh, that oscillates over the orbit, that's okay. Uh, but that piece doesn't have any sines and cosines. I am more interested in that one. I don't like Vs, can I, can I get rid of Vs? No. Okay. We agree on this, right? And uh, if you look at a portion of the orbit, I didn't mean to have a secure one, but this looks very secure. Let's just do something else. Okay, let's say that you're, I don't know, you're here. Okay. Position, vector. Your velocity is pointing in some direction. How do I get the norm of h if I decompose the velocity into these two directions, normal and tangential? Which one matters if you're doing a cross product? Do we agree with that? The normal, the, the radial component doesn't count in that cross product. If you break V into the two components, you have R cross 
velocity radial direction radial plus velocity tangential direction tangential you cross in these two you get a zero you are left with r cross vss these two actually happen to be perpendicular so the norm of this is actually rvs by definition so if i substitute right here rvs i'm not going to write another equation i'm sorry down here this is vs it's fine there down here instead of h i have rvs i have r squared vs so this can go away so at the end i have that term that i really care about minus a cubed one minus e squared over r squared density ballistic coefficient velocity I like that. And then there is this piece with the sine of theta. V, V, R. So as far as I'm concerned, you can stop here and you can look at this and say, okay, this is the rate of change. Remember, this is the rate of change of the same major axis. This is how it's changing at each moment in time. Um, I see two behaviors here. This one doesn't really have an oscillation, necessarily. Not like this one, sine of theta. And uh, what is it going to do to my same major axis? Density is a value that better be positive. I never heard of a negative atmospheric density. Uh, ballistic coefficient is a positive value. V is the normal velocity. Uh, now, you could argue that the eccentricity can go above 1. That, that part can, can actually change sign. Right? But for now, let's say that we are in closed orbits. We're not going to orbits that don't even have a, a, a physical same major axis. Uh, a cubed is positive, R squared is positive. So what's happening with this piece here? What is it doing to the same major axis? Is it going up? Is it going down? Decrease it, right? Other than the variability that it's, you know, the density is changing. Day-night variations, you can see the day and night multiple times, you know, in a few hours if you are in the right orbit. Uh, the velocity is going to change over time. This probably not that much. And these things, of course, are changing. But overall, here I see a minus something. I see a negative trend for dA, dt. Does it make sense? So that's how usually the Gauss variational equations are interpreted when you can write some meaningful expression. It's not always the case, but you know, with the assumption that the velocity of the atmosphere is not there, I was able to break it into PR and PS right away and then substitute it here and just look at it and, 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 and kind of guess what behavior I should expect uh, from my plots, which if you go back to the, um, yeah, those files that I posted with the solution for the orbital parameter. Um, you should see that. You should see the same major axis going down when you put drag, right? We saw that together, right? Plus, there is this term that oscillates with the true anomaly. So you don't only see a, a clean trend of the same major axis going down, but you do see some bumps along the way. It kind of it looks like it's going up and down a little bit, but it's slowly because this has the period of your orbit. It's a sign of the true anomaly, right? Does it make sense? So. Um, you know, you look at this equation, then you look at your plot, and you say, okay, this is, this is what I expected. It does make sense. Uh, now, the same kind of um, substitution can happen in all the other equations that they keep disappearing on me. I should probably plug in power so it stops doing this. Probably a good idea. Um, so the second one would be eccentricity, for example. If you uh, use the same PR and PS that I have, and go through a little bit of uh, algebra and simplifications here and there, you get actually something even nicer than this for the eccentricity. First of all, what do we expect that the eccentricity does to, due to drag? We saw that plot, right? Again, open, open the stuff that I, plus, that I posted. Um, before your homework too was due. So I gave you part of the solution. 
and look at what happens to all these parameters. So the EDT is minus, you should find something like this, minus B rho V E itself plus cosine of theta. So aside from this that oscillates, this is another negative behavior here, right here. That goes positive, negative, positive, negative, you know, as a period of t orbit. But this is another negative trend, you know, density is not negative, this is positive, this is positive. So the eccentricity is going down and that's what we have seen last time, plus an oscillation, there's always an oscillation. Uh, but it's a very slow one. If the orbit is ISS orbit, it takes about 90 minutes or so. So, but again, you look at your plot and you don't see a trend, just a constant, you know, a line going down. You see, you see these bumps. And so you keep doing this. <coughs> and uh, d theta, d th dt, you know, the true anomaly, I don't really see the benefit. I mean, you can. I have the solution, but you can look, look, look it up in your book. I don't see the benefit in spending too much time on this one. Because this is basically your time on the orbit. It does change a little bit due to perturbations, but really the same major axis, eccentricity, all the orbital parameters, the, the first five that we look at, they give me an idea of what's actually happen, happening to the orbit. So what do you think um, these ones are? By just looking at those. See, this could be a test question. Look at equation 12.48, if you have a perturbation that is in the orbital plane like drag is, because I modeled it that way, right? I said there is no V atmosphere, so everything is either radial or tangential. There's nothing on the W, correct? All right, so I ask you this kind of test. What would be the behavior of, in time of the inclination and the right ascension of the ascending node due to the drag perturbation? Zero. There's no, no PW, there's nothing, right? So that's there. That's all you have to say. Unless you introduce the atmospheric uh, rotation, in which case you do have some outer plane effects, which is true. Uh, but they kind of average out. Uh, what is left? The little omega, d omega in dt, if you go through the same kind of substitution, you should get something like rho b v over e sine of theta. What is actually happening to this one? should probably pull up the plot. What do you think is happening to that one? Positive, 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 positive. The oscillation due to the orbit is just basically going around. You know, you see the same behavior every orbit. But we know that the eccentricity is, with time, going down. So that's probably going down as well with some oscillation. And it, it does go down more and more with time as the eccentricity approaches zero. Make sense? So um, let's see if I can um, run this. Yeah, this should be. So this should be the same software I posted where, remember, I was integrating uh, the equations of motion and then converting to orbital parameters to see what that happens to them. Um, I'm going to stop right here. Except I took this function that uh, I gave you where here there was everything, J2 and drag. This is only drag. I removed the J2 part of the acceleration. And this is still the same little spacecraft that I had. You, you're more than welcome to change these numbers here, the surface, the mass. So let's see what happens if I only have drag and if it makes sense with the equations we have. And we're running here for 15 days. OK. Uh, hopefully something will pop up. Let's see. No errors. That's a good sign. OK. Okay, this is the 3D trajectory. I don't know how much you can get out of that. Remember, this was the altitude. Um, yeah, it does go down. Here, there's no J2, so I'm not modeling the planet in any particular way. It's a, it's a sphere with drag around it, that's all. So the altitude has to go down. There is drag, of course. 
it would be great if you could go up just by the drag force. Uh, this is the argument of perigee. Um, so I said this is going down. Um, I wasn't entirely correct. This is going. This part is going down. Uh, the minus rho b v e more and more uh, because e is shrinking. The eccentricity is decaying. is is going towards zero. Um, so this part as a norm, as a number, is, is increasing in magnitude with a minus in front, but then there is the oscillation that is multiplying. So, in other words, this is an oscillation that is growing in time, as you can see there. Does it make sense? It doesn't grow much. I mean, it, it's the second, you know, well, the first digit. But it does. After 15 days, it's, it's oscillating. And you have to keep in mind that it's always a matter of thresholds. When is an orbit circular? You had that Omor 2 SDK tolerance of 0.1, and it wasn't even maneuvering to the second uh, circle. So it's up to you to decide when it's circular enough. So when, when E for you is, okay, below this value is basically zero for me, then the argument of Perigee doesn't even exist anymore. But it's up to us to decide what we want to do with it. Uh, this is the REN. Um, I think it makes sense. I don't know how much is changing. That's numerical noise, right? It's the third digit is still the same everywhere. Yeah, so it's basically not changing. Um, inclination. I hope it's not changing either. It isn't. Third digit is more or less the same. It's numerical noise. You can probably make MATLAB run a little slower and have more accuracy and, and see that even more. And that's your eccentricity that is going down. Um, here it is. It is clearly going down, right? Well, very slowly. It's, I mean, this is only 15, 15, what did I say, 15 days? Yeah, 15 days. Um, but uh, it's oscillating as well. So in principle, each of those should be an orbital period. I don't know if I can zoom in and show that. Um, this is a low orbit, so the orbital period should be about an hour and a half or two. Does it make sense? Yeah. I think I can see that pattern of the oscillation. Right? Okay. Um, stop me if you have any questions, if this plot don't make sense. The same major axis has to go down. Uh, this should be a clear trend to go down and a little bit of an oscillation. Now, this part of the oscillation really depends on, on, on the values you have, but at the end of the day, you have the same major axis that is usually thousands of kilometers right? Uh, this is going down uh, with time. H is a pretty big number. It's the cross product of position and velocity. Uh, density is what it is. Um, so this, this, is, this oscillation is not that important in terms of how much you can see it in the plot. So in fact, if I don't zoom in, I don't even see it here. I clearly see that first piece, this one, it's going down uh, with time. And if I zoom in, I should see that oscillation. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's lost. It's there. It's not a straight line. And I could probably see it more with a, more, um, fi uh, with a finer time step for integration. I think I have 10 seconds, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But, um, so that, that proves, let me check the time step. Is it 10 seconds? Is that usually what you do, 10 seconds? Homework was 10 seconds? Oh, no, this is 60 seconds. So yeah, I could probably be better than that. Keep in mind that one minute you're flying yeah, hundreds of kilometers, right? Seven kilometers per second, so yeah. It's, you know, it's an approximation. You are integrating with MATLAB. It's not reality, but it makes, it makes sense uh, looking at these equations to get those plots. All right, so. Uh, what is coming next? Well, what is coming next is J2, but I'm not, I'm not going to actually do anything other than showing you uh, what is, again, the procedure behind doing this. This is the procedure. You want to introduce in those equations, the Gauss variational equations, the effect of J2. Well, you take what we have proven in class, this expression, this constant is in front of it, so the Cartesian expression for the J2 perturbation, Oblateness at the poles that we have proven in class that you've had in your code since basically the beginning. I gave you that function. 
but you can't use it in Cartesian coordinates, you have to project it into LVLH, and this is that monster matrix that uh, I projected last time, that allows you to go from some vector expressed in ECI, in the basis fixed in ECI, this one, to the same vector uh, expressed in LVLH. So it's just taking the vector and transforming it through this matrix to give you the radial, tangential, and normal um, projections of uh, that perturbation that is due to the oblateness at the poles. And these are the results. It's not for us to prove them. I, I wouldn't want to go into that because um, I have more interesting stuff that I want to cover for the rest of the class, rest of the semester. But uh, this is what you will have to introduce into whatever Gauss variational equation you're interested in. Um, okay. There is one example in your book right here that is looking at what would happen. I don't remember exactly what orbit it is. Well, this is the orbit. Let's let's zoom in. Uh, of course, it has to be a low Earth orbit, so it's relatively low. The perigee is pretty low. It's quite eccentric. Um, so you're given this initial orbit, and they're asking you to look at the behavior of the orbital parameters. And, uh, and there are results. Now, these are the results. Same image or axis, where is it? They give you angular momentum, actually. But this is the REN. The first one is the REN, goes down. Second one is the argument of perigee is going up. Angular momentum is oscillating, but there is a zero average in change. The eccentricity as well. See, this is the average. I don't know if you can see it. There is a straight line. There is a change over time, but the, there is no secular trend. There is no clearly going up or down. And an interesting set of equations uh, that people also look at are the averaged Gauss variational equations, where you basically don't want to see all these sines and cosines of the true anomaly. You want to get rid of that kind of behavior. And so if you were to average them over one orbit, you can get the uh, average behavior of the gas variational equation. So in other words, uh, for example, for this case, what would be the average behavior of the eccentricity over time? What would be, if I call E bar the average eccentricity, what is, what is it doing according to that plot? It's zero, right? While, for example, the average ran, the one on top, so if you remove the oscillation, it's an integral over the, uh, over the orbit. I'm not going to prove these formulas, but if I want the d big omega average over time, you can find this. You can find that this is minus 3 over 2, j2, square root of mu, equatorial radius squared over a to the 7 over 2, 1 minus e squared, squared, cosine of the inclination. So this is clearly not zero. It, it can be zero. When is it zero? So this is capturing of that plot that is going down, you see, and it's oscillating a little bit. It's capturing only the average behavior, which is going down. It's the slope, not, not the oscillation. The oscillation is gone. So. This clearly tells me that something is happening to the average REN other than the oscillation, but is in principle going to increase or decrease depending on what? This is a positive number, positive number, positive number, positive number. I want to say it's positive for secular, you know, elliptical orbits, uh, but still, this is a square anyways. Um, there's a minus here, and there's a cosine of the inclination. Those are the two things, well, Actually, the cosine of the inclination is the only thing that can change, really, the sine. So what is happening there? If the cosine of the inclination of your orbit is positive, 
which means that the angle, the inclination is what? How do you get cosine positive? Zero to 90, right? Okay. Um, what does this do? You may, you may think that this stuff is, eh, I don't care, but this, this is very useful information. This is how you, 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 you design your orbits and you, you predict how they're going to behave, in average at least. What is the sign of this? If the cosine is positive, it's negative, right? So that's, that's the case you're looking at. In fact, the inclination of this orbit was, I don't know, whatever it was, yeah, 28 degrees. So for orbits that have an inclination between, so this is corresponding to 0 and 90 interval. You can include them if you want. Um, you get a retrograde behavior of the ran. In 3D, this is what is happening. Your plane is rotating, of course. Remember, the ran is the angle between the uh, equatorial plane, you know, the line that we call the line of nodes, intersection of the equatorial plane, x, y, of the ECI, and the plane of the orbit, and you look at the side of the line where, where the spacecraft is on its ascending node, right? So basically, it's, it's coming up from south to north, right? This is the ascending node. So, if, if the inclination of this orbit is between, you know, those two values, these will reduce, other than the oscillation that you see, it will go to smaller values. Your orbital plane is rotating this way. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, that's case one. Now, what else? If cosine of the inclination is less than zero, which corresponds to the other cases, right? 90, let's exclude it, for example, I include 180. Um, well then, this is positive. So you have a, a prograde behavior, so that ran is actually increasing, the orbit is, you know, the plane is rotating in terms of the line of nodes, it's going the other way. This is the effect that we have exploited for sun synchronous, remember? You want to set that average behavior. You don't really care about the oscillation that much. But the average behavior, you want it to be at the correct rate so that you face the sun with the orbit all the time. Um, now, there is a case where it's uh, zero. 90 degrees, polar orbit. Does it physically make sense, if you imagine what's going on, you have this uh, circular ellipsoid, you're flying around, and, and so, if you're, if you're flying on a polar orbit, you are basically contained in a plane that is a plane of symmetry for this ellipsoid. Do we see that? Take a ball, squeeze it at the poles, and then choose a plane that is on, containing that axis where you, you, you put pressure to squeeze the ball. So why, you know, everything that a spacecraft is seeing, right and left, in terms of gravitational attraction, is the same at all times. Does it make sense? You are on the plane of symmetry of that object that is attracting uh, that is attracting you all the time. So, but if you see a symmetric attraction on both sides, there's nothing that is going to perturb that plane. There's no reason for your plane to change. Instead, for all other inclinations where you're not containing the poles with your orbit, then, then there is this asymmetric distribution of masses that you see that, it, that they're going to, to change your plane. Does that follow some logic? Um, what else? Sun synchronous. Now we can finally go and justify what uh, we discussed some time ago. Uh, a sun sync orbit is the one where basically the omega dot that you impose, the average omega dot, okay? So let's, let's just call it that, as I called it there. The D omega bar over T is equivalent to 360 degrees over a year. 
which is actually a little more than 365 days. So uh, if you pick a certain, and you have code for this, I gave you the example as well at some point, um, where we're talking about ground tracks. Uh, if you pick a certain same major axis, an initial eccentricity, these are all constants that are given, of course, and you want to put yourself in a sun synchronous orbit, you basically have this number, whatever it is, it's a constant, and you solve for the correct inclination that will give you that rate of change of big omega, big omega average. Making sense or not? This is the angular velocity of the planet around the sun. So of course you need to be with the plane in the, at the right initial condition so that you are facing the sun at each point of the orbit, but if you have picked the right combination of uh, same major axis eccentricity and inclination to match the rotation of the planet around the sun, then you're going to rotate with that plane so that you always see the sun. So this explains those numbers that I picked in the MATLAB code I gave you when we looked at that case, sun synchronous. This was the code where I had the different options, Molny orbits, sun synchronous orbits, just geosynchronous, geostationary orbits, where we discussed, hey, the geostationary orbit is really a point on the ground track, as it should be. So go back and check at the combination for the sun synchronous and see if, if this condition is actually met, where this monster equation here is giving you a rate of change of the angle that matches um, the angular velocity of the planet around the sun. Okay. But what is another use of these averaged equations? What time is it? Wow. Okay. This is going to be the last one. No, you don't care about what the planet is doing under you, no? I thought, I don't know, it was a while ago, I thought it was like 360 plus the rotation of the planet that you have to cover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you are confusing with um, the calculation for geostationary orbits. Uh, okay. So you need to make sure, so yeah, I think that's what it is. In computing uh, the radius for the geostationary orbit, uh, you need to make sure that you're basically pointing always down at the same location on the planet. So yes, you have to add that little, over the 24 hours uh, period, you have to add that little bit of change because you've gone around the sun a little bit. Okay. Yep, yep. So, okay. The little omega one is also of interest and is being used by the Russians quite a bit. This one, d omega dt for the Molnia orbits. By the way, Molnia means lightning in Russian. Um, okay, so this is the equation. Minus 3 over 2, j2, square root of mu, r squared again. This is another a7 over 2, 1 minus e squared, e squared. And then here I have... 5 over 2 sine squared of the inclination minus 2. Okay. This also behaves in different ways depending on your inclination at the end of the day. So, uh, just to make it quick, the omega bar dot, which is equivalent to this, is um, positive if your angles are well, your inclination is, actually, between 0 and 63.4 degrees, which is where this part is negative, right? If you solve for this equation, if you impose this to be positive and you solve for the intervals, that's what you get. Otherwise, so omega dot is negative if, if you are outside of this interval, which is, well, I'm sorry, this is not done. Um, inclination can also be between... 116.6 degrees and 180. Okay, so in these two intervals you get this kind of behavior. Um, otherwise, if the inclination is between 63 and 116.
So you can also make your, if, assuming that you have an elliptical orbit, of course, because otherwise the little omega it's kind of undefined, right? Uh, but if you have an elliptical orbit, um, you can choose what the line of apse is doing, right? Um, by choosing the inclination. Once you pick, for example, say that you picked same major axis eccentricity, you can pick the inclination to have this behavior or something else. In this case, it's pretty obvious that this is the positive uh, combination. So this one, and in fact the inclination was 28 degrees, so it matches this interval. And so for um, the Molnia ones, I believe the inclination is around 63 degrees or so, uh, which is uh, one of the points where you're crossing from positive to negative. In other words, you don't get any change in little omega. So you don't get the line of apse to change in time due to J2. You position yourself in a certain way so that the line of apse in space is always pointing in the same direction because maybe that's the direction for you to spy down from. Uh, that, that was the idea with the Molnia orbits. Very eccentric where the apogee is looking down more or less at the same location. And you don't want the, the, the line of apse to change all the time. right? Uh, so that is how these equations are used, for example. Now, I am suggesting you, and we'll discuss it next time because there is no more time almost, um, yeah, a few minutes. I am suggesting you to do the following. The uncollected homework seven. Same from last year, you don't need to change anything. What that homework is doing is basically the following. I'll just go right to the point here. Remember where I am doing all this? I take Cartesian coordinates and I'm converting through a certain function. Sorry, I'm highlighting and I shouldn't do that. And I am converting my Cartesian coordinates into uh, orbital parameters. Well, you could actually forget all that and, um, and integrate directly the Gauss variational equations because they are six nonlinear differential equations. The ones you're integrating right now, they're six nonlinear differential equations. Except the, the variables you're using are x, y, z, x dot, y dot, z dot. Now these are a, a e, i, etc. This, there's no difference. They're just longer and uglier, probably. But um, what I'm asking you to do is add basically one line inside this for loop, I think. No, not inside the for loop, I'm sorry. When you integrate and, uh, and obtain, you should obtain the same behavior for the, same, for the orbital parameters when you actually directly integrate the Gauss variational equations. So try it for J2, for example. Um, just pick one perturbation, just do J2, do one at a time. But try to implement in MATLAB these equations that we have seen. The DADT is not here, but I gave it to you. Try to implement this where for J2 you will have to pick the PR, PS, uh, and PW that is given by the book and compare with the orbital parameters that you were obtaining before through conversion of Cartesian coordinates. They should be on top of each other, otherwise something is wrong. Okay? We'll, we'll look in, into it uh, next time.